morning. My name's Chad, one of the pastors here. It's so good to be together. Uh, two things there. You heard them. I just want to reiterate a little bit about the Texas uh, giving. First, thank you so much. Uh, you guys were super generous the first week. We're going to do one more. We've got the box out there. You can also just give right directly on our website. Um, Pastor Brandon and Austin Oaks Church are taking those funds and they are helping people get their plumbing back. Um, and it's kind of a situation where every other person you know had frozen pipes and no water. And so super excited about that. Also, Keith and Christine, uh, go on madealiveworldwide.com or go to our PV Winona site and click on the missions and you can get there. Watch the full interview, listen, pray for them, send them an email, send them a gift, whatever. Just be in their world, in their life. You have no idea how much it means to know that uh, we're partnering together in the gospel. So it's a great thing. Uh, I want to pray for us. Let's do it. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the truth that the gospel, which uh, your word tells us was actually in the works before the world began. So before you came up with the amazing idea to put bark on a tree or to have a flower smell a certain way um, or to have bees and, you know, just amazing things that you've created, Lord, before all of that, you were putting into play and planning for the gospel and for the kingdom of God to work. And so as we hear our brother and sister in Seattle, we know what you're doing out there. We we see Brandon, our friend in Texas, and the way you're using them, Lord, around the world, your name is going forth. Your word cannot be stopped. Your kingdom will last forever. And so, Lord, we're a part of it this morning. We're excited. We're thankful that we get to be together and to worship together. And so, Lord, whether we're here in person or online, meet us by your Holy Spirit. Do what you do best. Lord, your word tells us that your Holy Spirit's job is to illuminate our hearts, to actually wake us up and to give us understanding and to remind us of the things that you said, Jesus. And so do that this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Luke's gospel. If you're just joining us, uh, you're right on time. The Lord knows exactly what you need to hear today. We're in Luke chapter nine, verse 43 and a half because it was a weird division that somebody decided to do. Um, And so find that. And while you get there, I want to tell you a quick story. I was a junior at Wheaton College. I went to college and I played soccer. I was not one of those superstars. I wasn't recruited. I remember calling the coach saying, hey, I'm interested in trying out for the team. And he said, be in shape. Click. That was it. I was like, okay. This is going to be crazy. And so I made the team, uh, worked hard, learned a ton um, playing at an NCAA Division III school. I was like, big cheese, big stuff. I'm excited. I'm on the team. I played college soccer. I worked my way up to a starting position by my junior year. And I thought, man, this is great. This is what other people celebrate. They would say, this is awesome. This is the kind of thing, you know, that you get accolades for. And, and you can say later in your life, I play college soccer, you know. And, and so I was super pumped. But then I got hurt in spring practice. No big deal, right? Going to heal up, come back for my senior year, finish it out, and can carry that on. And so I was surprised when I got a call from my coach. And he said, we would like to meet with you. I was like, Okay. And he came into his office and he said, what are you thinking? What are you, what are you thinking about next year? I was like, I mean, I think I'm going to be here playing soccer, you know. And they looked at me and said, well, we have some freshmen coming in. They're better than you. And so you can stay, but you won't play. I was like, well, then I guess I won't stay. And I remember I stood in front of my team and told them, you know, what coach had said and that I'm just going to bow out gracefully. And he bugged me and he came up, put his arm around me. He was like, let me tell you something about this guy. He's not a quitter. And I was like, "Eh." like, just don't touch me. You know, (laughs) I was bitter. And in my head, I'm talking to the Lord on the way back to my dorm. I'm like, how can this be the way? How can this be a good thing? This is painful. 
This is embarrassing. This is a demotion. This is not what I had in mind for greatness, <laughs> for doing well. I don't want this story. I don't want this story later in life. Yeah, I played college soccer until I got cut or until I was suggested to step off the team. I want the hero story. Yeah, I played, top this, top that, scored these goals, blah, 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 blah. But that wasn't the story. I'll tell you how that ends later. But I wanna set it up to say, Ephesians says that we are God's workmanship. And it's a word that is actually where we get the word poem from, poema. We are God's poem. We are his artwork. But that art can take some time. It can take some work. It can take some painful things. So today, as we look at the passage that we have, I actually, I opened it up. And a lot of times I don't, like I, I'm, what I do is I spend time with God's word, whatever we're doing the next week. And I ask him to work on me. I ask him to teach me. I don't get up here and say, what do they need to hear? And well, we've planned out this 20 years in advance. Like I don't do that. I actually open it up and I'm like, what's the next? No. I open and I'm, a lot of times I'm like, I can't believe it because Jesus today is going to say something he just said like a chapter before. And he actually says, I need to tell you something again. And later it's going to come again. And I was telling some of the guys, I'm like, I'm not preaching the third time. Somebody else needs to preach and talk about it the third time because I don't have anything else to say. So I'm going to talk about it for the second time, but this is kind of God's way. There's a good reason that he is going to repeat himself today. So let's look. I'll show you what I mean. Luke 9, 43b, 43 and a half. Here we go. While they, disciples, were all marveling. They're all hopped up. They're all excited. It's been so good. We've been seeing Jesus transfigured, Elijah, Moses. We've been seeing miracles. This is awesome. They're marveling at what he's doing. They're walking with a little bit of a, you know, a, a little hitch in their giddy up. They're kind of excited about what God is doing. Jesus said, eh, hang on. Let these words sink into your ears. And you know, one of the disciples was like, uh-oh, here we go. The son of man, Jesus, is about to be delivered, betrayed, handed over into the hands of men. And if you look at Mark's gospel, which was a source for Luke, it also fills in a few more details. The son of man is gonna be betrayed, delivered, killed, and then be raised from the dead. But they didn't understand what he was saying. It was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. Just sometimes you read something and you're like, are you trying to, to not help them? Like, that's what I think sometimes I read this. I'm like, come on, they don't get it. And furthermore, they're being prevented from understanding it. It's like, oh, great. That's just awesome, Lord. And it says they were afraid to ask him about it. So it's all just a mess. While they were still marveling, this is the Jesus train. I can be on board with this. I'm all about it. If this train goes to every city and we heal people and we get more people and we get more people that we can say, hey, buy Jesus stock. This thing is going up and up and eventually we take over the world and the King of Kings is here, baby. Let's do it. But Jesus says, don't get ahead of yourself, boys. Don't get beyond what needs to happen. There's work to be done here. There's something difficult that has to happen. And so he uses an idiom, a figure of speech, which he says, let these words sink into your ears. What's implied? You're not hearing. It's not sinking in. You're not getting it. Another way to say it is something that I think I heard from my mom a few times. Get this through your head. Did you ever hear that one? I have a thick noggin and uh, sometimes hard of hearing and hard of understanding. This is one of Michelangelo's, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, you know, that guy. Unfinished works. If you, I've been in Florence, Italy a long time ago, and you can walk through a studio that has a bunch of these slabs that are kind of partially done. Isn't it interesting? It's like the guy's trying to get out of there. He's trying to, to crawl out 
of the stone. And somebody asked Michelangelo about this, and he actually said, every block of stone has a statue inside it. It is the task of the sculptor, sculptor to discover it. He goes, I just saw the angel in the marble, and I carved until I set him free. Not, here's this block, and I think I want to do something with it. I'm not really sure. Maybe I can make it into this. He looked at it and he said, oh, there you are. Give me some time. I'll get you out. Give me some time and I'll get you out. Interesting word choice. Until I set him free. God releases the beauty in you and me by getting us out of the stone of our sin and fallenness. Both in the grand act of salvation through the cross, rescuing us, but also in the fine artistic work of sanctification. Let this sink into your ears. And I want you to hear, watch this little video. Found this this week of a sculptor working with marble. Now it's like just wondering how do they do it? You know, what's, what's the process? And this guy works with traditional means. Uh, and you can see it's like just very da, 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 very small strokes, very precise, getting right in there. And then you see these little things of marble just kind of flipping away. And so they keep getting the tools get smaller and smaller and smaller to well, eventually they're polishing with sandpaper getting it down to this very beautiful. So the more time we spend with Jesus, actually the more time he takes with you is the better way to say it. You will eventually take shape and form into what he wants. So the disciples are being chiseled upon here. God is going after them. He's saying the same thing. So it wasn't just one knock of the chisel. It was, again, again, same thing. I've got to die. The Son of Man has to suffer. Take up your cross. This will be a hard road. This will be difficult. This will be something that will hurt. Repeating over and over. So of all the things that he felt were important to teach and reteach and reiterate and explain and re-explain, this is the one. This is the one that he says, the son of man is about to be betrayed, handed over. So imagine the disciples, betrayed? Like by one of us? They start looking around, who is it? Who's not committed here? Who's not committed to this whole thing? Where Jesus all along knew it was Judas and invited him along because it was prophesied that there would be one who would do this. But this is gonna happen. But they didn't understand they even said, Mark says that they asked each other, what does he mean by raising from the dead? What does that even mean? They're afraid to ask. So it's quite a pickle, isn't it? They need to learn something. They aren't getting it. He's telling them again and again. They aren't hearing it. Somehow in the sovereignty of God, they're being prevented from hearing it. Come on. They're afraid to ask. Chip, 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 chip. Hear the hammer. See the chisel at work. This is the second time there will be a third as I said, I'm probably really going to try not to preach on that one. I want somebody else to take a whack at it. But I sat with the Lord and I actually wrote it down this way in my notes because I was sitting in my office. I was telling a couple of people, I, I am a tough, thick-headed piece of brisket when it comes to learning. It takes a long time on the smoker to soften me up to where I'm going to get it. And so I was sitting there and I wrote this, Lord, I'm sitting here. <laughs> I wrote it in my notes. I'm sitting here with you and I'm asking you why? Why this way? Seriously, Lord, why this way? Why did you have to die? Why not just wipe the slate clean? Can't you do that? Aren't you creator God? You love us. That's clear. You made us. That's clear. Just fix us without death. Why this? Why did Paul say, if I preach anything other than Christ crucified, let me be accursed? 
I remember being in a church years ago and somebody got up front and said, you know what? I've decided not to talk about the cross anymore because the resurrection is where it's at. And even as a young believer and not a Bible scholar, and I wouldn't consider myself a Bible scholar now, I sat there and the spirit of Jesus in me said, that's not right. That's not right. And I remember that verse about Paul saying, I better be preaching Christ crucified. I better hold it up as the trophy of trophies because it doesn't go away. Isn't it interesting that Paul says, I'm all about preaching resurrection after Jesus is resurrected. No, he says, I'll preach Christ crucified because there's a mystery in the fact that Jesus died and he's calling us to die. Oh, the wonderful cross bids me come and die and find that I may truly live. What is this mystery? Why does it have to be this way? So as I was sitting with the Lord, being brisket, letting him work on me, and I'd said, that is what I do. I don't have it all tucked away somewhere. It is seriously in the crock pot, on the smoker all week. And I'm trying, and it doesn't happen just sitting at the desk. It happens at the hockey game. When I'm watching my son, it happens in the shower. It happens when I'm laying there at night and I can't go to sleep. I'm asking the Lord, what are you doing? What's going on? And this was just a sweet I don't know, just impression, revelation from Jesus to me. So it was real simple. And I know I'm simple, simple brisket. But it said this, sin leads to death, Chad. It's like, okay, I'm tracking. Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you do nothing about your sin problem. And you have one. You were born with it. David said it. Surely I was conceived in sin. You're born with it. Do nothing about it. You will die in your sin and you will be forever separated from God. Not annihilated, not poof, not, oh, you're done. It's eternal separation or eternal closeness with him. That's what the Bible says. So do nothing. That's what happens. And we all have heard maybe at some point in our life, you've been to Sunday school, VBS, some church, some version of there's a debt we owe for our sin, right? Not because God's mean or because he held out some vendetta just to get you. It's in the way that his holiness is kind of like this massive bonfire and you walk up next to it with this piece of tissue paper. What happens to the tissue paper? It can't get near. It can't get close. Sin and God cannot abide. And so he must deal with it. So we know that. We, we, we've heard some version of that in our life. Somebody said that even if it was for a fire and brimstone person. We know that. But here's what the Lord just kind of settled in for me. Sin leads to death. Like just think of it as like a a trip. Like you got to go to where death is. If sin leads there, and this is what I thought God was saying, Chad, this is war. And there's an enemy. And the enemy is the sin and death which lives in your heart, fueled by demonic forces and spiritual powers. And that enemy has a beachhead. That enemy has territory. You know what I did on the cross? Where do you go to fight the enemy? You take the fight to them. You invade the beachhead of death. You go there. And so why did Jesus have to die? Yes, to pay the price for our sin, but to go into enemy territory to wipe it out. And Revelation 118 tells us, Jesus says, behold, I was dead, but now I live forevermore. And guess what I have? Jingle, 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 the keys to death and hell. I took them. I went there for you. So sitting there, I was like, oh, oh, why does he keep talking about this? He holds the keys. And here was the kind of what I felt was a, like if there had been like little chisels in my heart all week, this is the one where I felt like he was like, (laughs) just like a, a real hard hammer to my heart in a good way. In order to chisel away at your life, to make you into, make you like Christ, to redeem you, to restore you, to save you. He needed to first face the final and ultimate hammer of God and be crushed. Jesus had to take the full blow of God's hammer and his wrath in order for us to be able to be his 
beautiful creation. Some of us still need to hear this today. Maybe it's the first time and you're like, I didn't even know that was what it was all about. And I need that. I realize that. I see this pattern of death in my life. I cannot win. Others need to hear again. You know what? I've been avoiding anything that has to do with taking up my cross and I need to listen. So Jesus, as he does it the second time and as he will do it the third time and as Paul and others will repeat it again and again, Jesus says, put that track on repeat. We're not shuffling the rest of the tracks. We're putting this one on repeat. Chip, 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 tapping away. Why? Because we have a patient, faithful, keep loving you, stay with you, never stop pursuing you, Jesus. That's him. He's making it clear he will be killed, he will be betrayed. So, and the Bible tells us how they respond. They respond with, huh? We don't get it. Sometimes our lack of understanding comes out in the way we live. Our hard pieces of stone that don't wanna give way to the chisel They're stubborn, they stay there. It comes out in how we act and what we say and what we think about other people. And so we're gonna look at three tiny little Polaroids of the disciples. Their lives are gonna be on display for you to watch them being thick-headed, showing you what it's like to not have this get through their head. We're gonna read all three of them real quick. Just have a couple things to say about them. But here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to go, wow, those guys really had, had it rough. I want you to say, is that me? Is that me? Verse 46, an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Just think about that. The conversation even happening. Nuh-uh, I am. No, I am. It's like middle school. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, and Mark actually tells us that he said, hey, what are you talking about? He loved them enough to ask them, what are you talking about? Took a child and put him by his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. You wanna see greatness? Look at this little one. 49... John's, let me change the subject. Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And so (laughs) we tried to stop him, of course, because he's not in our club. He does not follow with us. We do not, we didn't think you would want that. So don't worry, we stopped him. We tried to. Jesus said, don't, don't stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. Verse 51, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, which is code for die, okay? He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He's fixed, he's on it, he's going to do this. He sends messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. This is a little bit of that sovereignty of God stuff going on. Kind of like the whole thing of like, they don't understand and they were prevented from understanding. Oh, that's helpful. This is, they didn't receive him because he was set to go to Jerusalem, but it's an important piece. And when his disciples, James and John saw it, they said, we have a great idea. They rejected you. So Lord, can we just call for fire to come down from heaven and burn them up? (laughs) We think that's a great solution. You know, welcome to church. You reject, we call for fire as you're leaving the building. But he turned and rebuked them and they went on to another village. I bet they did. So three snapshots of the disciples all close together. And the heart stuff is what I want you to see. There's outward things that are happening, but it's the heart stuff that maybe is a little close to home. And we're going to get into them just very briefly. But what this little section amounts to is a really bad day for the disciples a really bad day for the disciples or a nice day of chiseling for Jesus. That's how I want you to start to think about these things and frame them. And you may have had one of these days recently, um, but what's interesting about bad days isn't always the outward stuff that is happening, but it's the inward heart conversations you're having with yourself that is fueling the outward stuff. You kind of figure that out early on in marriage, 
um, where you start having an argument about something. You know, one time we were having an argument about the vent in the car. Guess what? That wasn't the thing. <laughs> that wasn't what was really upsetting. We were having deeper discussions and other things that were difficult. And so it's the heart stuff that you want to look at. And so Jesus asked the question, hey, what were you talking about? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. And I do think that it's, we're, we're not this, well, we're actually savvy when it comes to talking about being great. We don't say, I am the greatest. I am the greatest. Like we don't pull the Muhammad Ali thing when we're walking around with our coworkers or at school or something like that. We're, we're more savvy. We do things like we're in a conversation and you know you did this great thing or you know you got to go to this thing or went on this trip or had this great food and you kind of just subtly and very creatively weave it into the conversation. Listen to this really silly, amazing thing I did. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, and it's, it's our way of saying, I'm better than you. We wouldn't say those words, but it's what we're doing. It's what we're doing. And sometimes it's, I am better than you and I'm going to stick it to you with this. So, because we live and breathe self, that is the problem. We're stuck in the stone. And I love it that Jesus actually loves them enough to ask the question. He could have said, Father, it's a really bad day for them and we're just going to press delete. We'll start again tomorrow. It's not what he does. He says, all right, chisel, hammer, Tick, tick, tick. What you talking about? What's going on in your heart? He's faithful. This, and I love the way he responds. He grabs this little kid and I don't want you to think that there was like a little calm, quiet child sitting there listening to Jesus. Look at this child. So simple, so child. I want you to see a kid running laps around Jesus' legs and just like they're trying to listen. Jesus is trying to teach. There's this kid just running like crazy. And Jesus actually has to catch him to make the point. And he's like, help, oh, hold on a second. The kid's like, well, okay, okay. And just wants you to see like red face, sweat, you know, hair kind of pushed down there, out of breath. And Jesus says, this is what I want you to have in your minds of greatness. This is greatness. Now, could the kid teach a lesson? Memorize a Bible verse? Sit still in church? Nope. Laughs when he should be quiet. Sleeps when he should be listening. Plays when everybody else is trying to understand something. But this is the thing. He sure does love to be with Jesus though. That's kind of the point. That there's this simple father, child. I just like being with you. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I love being with you. Jesus says, that is great. That's greatness. How about the next guy pretending to protect the Jesus club? I don't want anybody else getting credit for what we're doing. This is our thing. And I can't believe that guy's doing it this way. He's not doing it the right way. Jesus says, just let it go. Just let it go. Get low. We say that around here on staff. Get low. If somebody else is doing something great for Jesus, get low. Don't feel your need to actually say, well, me too. Look at what I've, what I've been a part of. Get out of the way. Let Jesus get that glory. The final one, though, is a doozy. It's a doozy because it's, Lord, they're not responding. Can we just call down fire? Can we just burn up these people that didn't respond to you? This made me remember my sister, my younger sister, Amanda, um, and something she said to her husband, John, my brother-in-law, which has become a phrase in our house that we say kind of as a funny but my sister is one of those people that if, if you're sitting next to her and she's eating something and she thinks you should try it, you will try it. <laughs> she will hound you until you try it. Try this, try this, try this. It's the try this, try this, try this. Keeps moving it closer and you finally try it and you're like, fine, I tried it. Isn't that the best thing you have ever had? And you're like, I better say yes or she'll make me take another bite. So she was in one of those moments of wanting to get a dog for their family. And so she was hounding John, my brother-in-law. We need a dog. Can we get a dog? We just really need to get a dog. We need to get a dog. Look how cute. Look how me, blah, blah, And he turned to her and we were sitting there and it was our whole family was gathered. And he said, Amanda, it's my sister. He said, we are not getting a dog. And she turned to him and she said, you're ugly when you say that. And that has become 
a phrase in our house. Like sometimes when you don't get what you want or whatever, you're ugly when you say that. <laughs> but I think this is one of those moments. Lord, shall we just call down fire from heaven? I think Jesus could easily turn to them and say, you are so ugly when you say that. <laughs> that is not what I want. And I think it should lead us to an even deeper question. We should be really careful in how we apply what we think are the teachings of Jesus. The village didn't receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. What that tells me is that he was on schedule and he wouldn't be staying in that village. The Lord was orchestrating the moments of the time that indeed look like rejection, for sure. But truly, we're all part of the gospel, which had been put in motion before time began. So when you think that, well, my friend, my family member, my coworker, they've rejected Jesus. They might as well just be burned up now. You're saying no to Jesus, you might as well just die because you're going to hell. That's kind of, we get into this like cut and dried. I think we need to hear that gentle rebuke of Jesus and the chisel saying, uh, I have a plan. I have a plan and it's working. And your plan is not my plan. Your ways are not my ways. So quit writing people off. You're like, well, I don't write people off. Oh, really? Are there groups of people, say political parties, that you think are beyond hope? No way. And you think, Lord, just burn them up. Just burn them up. They're leading us into blah, 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 whatever it is. Maybe the Lord might be doing a little stuff behind the scenes that we don't understand. And he's calling for us to stay steady and gentle and compassionate and compelling with the gospel. Because what might look like a really bad day for people and they're not pursuing just might be God doing stuff behind the scenes. Because here's the thing, your bad day is his work day. What you think is a bad day is Jesus doing perfect work in your life. You think, oh, I can't believe this is coming out again. This struggle, this sin, this thing, this relationship. Why can't I just be done with it? And Jesus is the great physician. I'll change metaphors a little bit, but he knows exactly where to poke. He knows the thing that is not healed yet. The hammer holds. The chisel finds its mark. He's the master sculptor. These moments, these three, you're ugly when you say that moments, are chisel marks. And he's hitting it. It's becoming something beautiful. A few more knocks of the hammer and then we'll be done. Verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus. I'm in. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, uh, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. Whoa, when's the last time you walked into a funeral and said that and left? <laughs> Nobody does that. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I'll follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I'll follow you wherever you go. If one of your friends that had previously rejected Jesus and that you thought should be burned up immediately actually came back to you and said, no, no, wait, I will follow Jesus today. Wouldn't you be like, that's, well, I won't even say anything because I'll probably mess it up. That's great. That's awesome. Let me come to church with me, whatever. Like you'd be so excited. You'd think Jesus would be so excited. It's the right words. It's, it's the right phrase, right? I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And yet Jesus seems a little standoffish, a little brusque and cold and almost kind of furrowing his brow a little bit and saying, you know what? I don't really have a home. I sleep outside. You sure? You sure you're in? You really want to follow me? You see these guys? I've been talking about death, betrayal, taking up your cross. They just had a really bad day. You sure you want that? 
You sure you want to be a part of that? Well, actually, I, maybe I need to take care of a few things first. That's what I thought. Whoa, Lord, we need to go back to evangelism class. That doesn't seem to be the right way. Or we text Jesus and say, Jesus, sorry, didn't sleep well, feeling bad, not going to make it. It's easy to do now, isn't it? You don't have to talk to people face to face. You can just fire off that last minute text. This brings us to a question. What's your excuse for not following Jesus? This is Michelangelo's David, a finished sculpture, probably one of the most famous in the world. And I got to see it 15 years ago. First, I want you to notice how big it is. It's massive. Yeah, I think that's the first thing that you, because, you know, you see it in pictures and history books and you're like, yeah, David, whatever. He's naked. Like, you know, you kind of go through this thing. You get in person and you're like, like his, his foot is as big as a human being. That's the size and the scale. But also, and you can't see it as much, but if you look, you kind of see the veins on his arm. If you get a close up of the hand, there's like every vein, every, fa- it's perfect. It's perfect. But here's the thing, David started out as a massive, cold slab of marble way up in the Tuscan hillside that had to be cut out and still didn't look like anything. So if this is who you're becoming, God's masterpiece, his handiwork, what's your lame excuse for not following for trying to do it yourself. Because what's amazing about all these people is that they all said they would, but didn't. How many people will stand before the Lord one day and say, I said I would, I even went forward at the camp and then I just never, never did anything with it. How many will have that story? Jesus could have coddled these people. He could have held their hand and go, it's okay. I know it's hard, it's tough stuff, but I love you. You know, I I don't want to give you too much. I don't want to give you too much to handle. No, he is very specific for each of these people. And that's what I want you to to see. He's not being cold or, you know, rude. He's very specific. Like the guy that said, I will, I just see a lot of zeal. Man, I'm in. Yes. Yeah. Ha. I'll follow you, Jesus. I'm your guy. And I think Jesus is like, calm, calm it down. Let's talk for a second. Let's talk about what the cost is going to be. Are you truly there? See, Jesus knew the chisel marks that needed to happen in this guy's life that weren't quite there yet. He knew that some work needed to happen. And so he pushed back. He pushed back and said, this is going to be difficult. How about the guy that said, I need to go and bury my father. Is it wrong to actually go to your parents' funeral? No. So that can't be what's going on. It can't be, I've just got to go. It'll be a 30 minute service, Jesus. I promise I'll be back. My guess, dad hasn't died yet. That's my guess. He's making this thing of like, ah, I mean, I, my dad's at home and maybe after he dies, maybe then. What does Jesus see through? Right to the core of like, you're not serious. You're not hearing me. You're not seeing the cost. How about the last one that says, well, I just need to go and, and say goodbye to some people. And you can always see with the answers that he gives. He seems rude at first, but then with the guy that wants to bury his father, what does he say? Go proclaim the kingdom of God, which makes you think maybe he was holding back and delaying. The person who said, I want to go and I just need to go say goodbye to some people. Jesus says to the person who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit. What does that tell me about this guy? He's probably been doing this thing over and over again. I think I will. Well, I got to go do this. Now I'm going to go make this excuse. What's your excuse? The answer is, there's not a good one. There's not a good one. You must follow Jesus. So Wheaton College soccer, the chisel marks on my, the fresh chisel marks that were on my heart and soul and reputation. And uh, how could you do this, Lord? How could this be the way? That is the death of something that I thought was important, that I wanted other people to know about me, to say, that's great. So 
I joined a gospel choir. <laughs> From soccer to a gospel choir. That was, my, that was my answer. But how interesting though, and those of you who know how I got here, that I started working on music. And I started singing solos in the gospel choir. And I would turn around and the gospel choir is behind me and I had the lead and I would turn around and I would look at this one girl and I would sing worshiping, but I'd kind of look at her and smile. Well, guess who that was? Lisa. And she'd smile back. And then I was like, you know what? I think I kind of like to teach the Bible. I got up in front of gospel choir and I said, if anybody wants to come to a Bible study in my apartment, I'm going to be teaching on the book of Mark. And Lisa showed up and she would tell you that's where she fell in love with me, watching me, my love for Jesus teaching. And then we got married and then we got Maya from Vietnam and Caleb came and Abigail. And do I really want soccer? (laughs) Would I trade all of this beauty all of this refinement, this artistic detail from Jesus in my life that has made me who I am and is still making me, would I say, no, but I, what I really want is to be able to say, yeah, I was top scorer, I made it all the way through and blah, blah, blah. Is that what I really want? No, no. I needed the faithful hand of Jesus, the hammer holding, the chisel basically putting to death some things in my life that needed to be put to death so that I would see his plan. Many chisel marks, a beautiful hand of the Savior holding it and swinging the hammer. His invitation to you this morning is to let him free you from the slab of sin and death for he is making something beautiful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your faithful hand in my life. Oh Lord, I, I see the magnificent sculpture that is my family. Lord, that is my honor and joy to be able to serve you here. Lord, I know that all of those things were a part of it. The death of what I thought was important and great, what truly opened up my heart to what you wanted to do in my life. And I know it's just a small, simple way of looking at it, Lord, and you do this in many other ways, but you have beautiful, wondrous plans for all of us, Lord. And we ask that you would give us the grace to respond, Lord, to allow you to chip away, to come after us. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to withstand and to take fully the full wrath of God on our behalf to have his hammer come down on you and break you. Lord, as your word says, it was the father's will to crush him. We rejoice in that this morning, Lord. And that because of that, Lord, we receive the joy and the privilege to be called your very own children. Lord, think of the verse, I think it's in the Psalms that said, your sons shall be as polished pillars in the house of God, made of marble, no doubt. Let us respond now as we worship together, find our place in Christ alone. Amen. Why don't we stand together?